morning, everybody. Thank you for staying. I'm going to talk uh, about something completely different than what you've just heard, because I'm going to talk about probiotics today. And what can probiotics offer pharma? And I'm going to talk about our products, and especially our ecologic line. And my name is Karen. You see me over here. Um, I've been working for our company Winklow for over 10 years now. I first obtained my PhD in, uh, in researching these probiotics. So I also know something about science, but now I work at the marketing and sales department. So that's why I'm here today. Um, who is Winklow? For those of you who don't know us, I think most of you don't know us. Winklow is a company, we're based in Amsterdam, the Netherlands, and we design, research and produce probiotic formulations for several applications. We started in 1991, so we have uh, experience for over 20 years. And currently we sell over 70 different probiotic formulations, so that's quite a lot. We export to 60 customers in about 30 different countries, mostly within Europe, but also outside of Europe in um, South America, America, Asia. So we have quite a lot of experience also in registering our products and in selling our products. And last year we sold over 50 million daily dosages. We're quite proud of that actually. So how do we sell? Well, we sell under private label. So basically we look for marketing partners with their own label and with their own experience. Um, because there is no Winklove label. We call it Winklove products or ecologic products within the company. But basically we are looking for partners with their own label or who can make their own label. We sell business to business, of course, otherwise we wouldn't sell private label. And we sell medical endorsements, at least most of our partners do, because we know that the probiotics are not easy to understand. And um, most of our su most successful business partners, they sell via the medical health professional, because that's the way to do it, because they train and explain this to doctors, pharmacies, dietitians, and then they spread the word to their patients and, and the cus consumers, basically. And we know that this can be a, a very good, successful way to sell probiotics. And we, as a company, are very flexible. We can tailor to your needs. And we have many different um, uh, customers. So I cannot say we do it like this, because as you can see here, I'm just showing a few of our products that are sold all over the world. Every customer is different and every market is different. And um, we believe that our customers know their markets best. And we always try to tailor to their needs. And we are a research-driven company. We spend a lot of our time and a lot of our energy in research and in researching these probiotics. So we're not just selling probiotics, we're also researching them. And you see that here we don't do research only by ourselves, but we do this in an external R&D network. And we do a lot of research with uh, university hospitals and research institutions. Of course, mostly based in the Netherlands, because that's easiest for us. It's close by in there. We have uh, very short links with them, but also in other countries like Austria, Germany, uh, um, Indonesia. And even with our partners and with their contacts, we do a lot of research. And again, here you see some of these research contacts. And just, I want to stress that we as a company spend a lot of time and effort in doing so, because we, we believe in our products and we want to show that they work. For those of you who are not familiar completely with what a probiotic is, I just want to tell you what is a probiotic. It's not a molecule. Please understand it's not like pharma, it's one molecule and one receptor, it's not. It's also not a protein. Now guys, it's a live microorganism and that also means that it works different from pharma. A lot of uh, people ask me questions that are very pharma oriented, but it's not pharma, it's a live microorganism. It can do a lot of things, depending also where it is and how you treat it. And it's therefore not so simple sometimes. But we learn a lot about them. Um, is it a new concept now? No, I just want to show you that it's basically not a new concept. Because this guy, Ali Metchinkoff, he actually um, discovered probiotics because he noticed that people in Bulgaria, they lived uh, much longer than in the surrounding countries. And it's because they ate Bulgarian yogurt, that's what he thought. And this contained Lactobacillus bulgaricus. And he won the Nobel Prize for it, so it's not a very new concept. but for us, you know, nowadays, is probiotics has not been really on the market only for, I think, 15 years, especially in Europe. Of course, in Japan, it's different, but nowadays, people have a great interest in probiotics, but it's not, a old, it's not a new concept, it's fairly old. And also, probiotics have been used, not as probiotics, but these bacteria have been used in the food industry for many years. For, for instance, yogurt, fermentation of, um, of uh, sauerkraut, cheese, meat. So it's not a new concept but the application is new. Well, what's the definition of probiotics? Again, for those of you who don't know, 
A probiotic is a live microorganism, which when administered in adequate amounts, and that's I think very important, can confer a health benefit on the host. And how do then probiotics work? Well, I'm not going to go in too much detail because this is not a scientific session. I'm just going to touch base on it. So to give you some concepts and some ideas on how it works. Um, and to understand this, you have to understand the microbiota. And the microbiota is basically the, ba the bacteria that we already possess, that we carry with us. And if we start in the stomach, we have little bacteria, only about 1,000. And then we progress down the GI tract. And we end up with 10 to the 12th. So that's quite a bit. There's a one with 12 zeros of bacteria per gram features. Ah, that's quite a bit. And especially if you look at the total amount of host cells, because the total amount of bacteria that are in and on our body is 10 times as much as that we have host cells. So basically, you are all sitting here, you're 90% bacteria and only 10% human. Just a, I think it's a nice concept to realize that, that bacteria play a very important role in our lives. Uh, we didn't know a lot about these bacteria until about 10, 15 years ago, because a lot of these bacteria, they don't like uh, oxygen very much, so we couldn't culture them. And nowadays we can look at their DNA and um, we have done many um, many projects. The MetaHit project is one of them. And they looked at the DNA of bacteria of humans. And we know now that they are in the GI tract of humans. So not within each person, but in the total population of humans. There's about 1,200 different species of bacteria. That's uh, a lot. And we also know that for each individual, we have a unique and personal microbiota. So every person, as you are sitting here, has a... Yeah, microbiota that is fit for him or her. And it's unique. And if you're an adult, it's relatively stable. It's a stable microbiota that doesn't change so much anymore. But this microbiota can get disturbed. And how does it come disturbed if you're an adult? Wrong nutrition. I'm not saying eating one Burger King hamburger on the exhibition will change your microbiota. But if you start a diet or if you become a vegetarian, this will definitely change your microbiota. Medication use, of course, most notably antibiotics will really influence and disturb this microbiota and also stress both mental and physiological stress like um, endurance sports. It's good of course if you're able to run a marathon but your microbiota doesn't really like it. And then this can lead to disease. And the FHO and the WHO have stated that this disturbance or an imbalance of this microbiota is directly linked to many diseases. Diseases like diarrhea, constipation, inflammatory bowel disease, irritable bowel disease, helicobacter pylori infection. And I think for most of you, that is a pretty clear link. I mean, you can, you can picture that. But it's also indirectly linked with other diseases. Diseases like allergy, cancer, cardiovascular disease, UTIs, bacterial vaginosis, and even diseases like autism and migraine are now linked with the disturbance of the microbiota. I'm not saying it's the only cause of the disease, that the microbiota plays an important role in these diseases. And I never expected, for instance, that it would be in autism. For me, that was a pretty far bridge, but there's a pretty conclusive evidence that at least it's partly caused by this imbalanced microbiota. So then how can we help this imbalance? Of course, I'm talking about probiotics today, so we do it with probiotics. And we use these bacteria to influence the microbiota in a preventative or therapeutic way. So how do these probiotics work? Again, I'm not going into detail. If you really want the details, I can show you the science. You have to visit our booth. But they work on three levels. And basically, they work inside the gut, where they actually influence the other microbes. They can produce all sorts of short-chain fatty acids and uh, microbiological agents. That's what they do here. You can see over here. They also work on the gut epithelial cells. We, o we often see in disease that this gut barrier, as we call it, is open. It's, it's broken. And uh, we have a leaky gut, as we call it, the leaky gut syndrome. And these probiotics can also influence this integrity of this barrier. And also, very important, these microbes can influence the immune system. For those of you guys who are not very familiar in it, if you don't have a microbiota, your T and your B cells, they don't develop, they know nothing. And this is what probiotics can do. They can really influence this immune system, and it's one of their yeah, well-researched mechanisms of action. And we at Winklow, we focus on two points within uh, our um, uh, producing probiotics. We focus at the bacteria, of course, because we believe that you have to select the right bacteria for the right application. But we also focus on other mechanisms, and that's what we call our probioact technology. And I'll explain it a little bit later. I'll first talk about the bacteria, because they are very important. 
There's different probiotics on the market. First of all, you have monostrain probiotics. And these probiotics contain one strain of one species. So they only, for instance, contain a lactobacillus acidophilus. Then you have multi-strain probiotics. They contain more uh, more strains, but always of the same species. So for instance, two lactobacilli or two bifidobacteria or four enterococci. And then you have multi-species probiotics, and they contain more strains of different species. For instance, a lactobacillus, an uh, enterococcus, and a bifidobacterium. And we, at Winklo, we only make multi-species probiotics. And why do we do this? Well, we know that the properties of one bacterium do not necessarily apply to another bacterium. So if you go into the shop and you need to buy two random probiotic products and it states lactobacillus acidophilus, lactobacillus acidophilus, you would expect, okay, it's the same bacterium. It's not, guys. I can tell you we've done a lot of research. It's also published. You can find this on the internet. Some of these lactobacillus acidophilus are, for instance, very good in producing IL-10. Others are not. So I compare them with humans. We are all different, and we all have different um, um, things that we are good at. Some people are very good at singing. Some people are very good at running the marathon. But none of us can do everything well. Some of us can do maybe two or three things very well, but none of us can do everything well. So we believe that if you combine strains with different properties, that you can have a higher efficacy. And... Um, we also think because you can uh, have this multi-species probiotic that you can actually act on all three levels much better because you can have these enhanced efficacy and you can have more properties in your product. And we're not just saying so. We also reviewed this ourselves in a, it's a fairly old paper, 2004, in which we compared functionality and efficacy of these different type of probiotics. And again, this was done by a different group. They looked at the health benefits of these monostrain probiotics compared to mixtures, multi-strain probiotics, multi-species probiotics. And the basic conclusion was from both papers, and e recently another paper came out, that these multi-species probiotics in general have a higher efficacy. And what's our philosophy? Well, our philosophy at Winklove is that not all diseases have the same background. We know that they have many different aspects, and most diseases are multifactorial. It's not just one thing that causes the disease, because then all diseases would be fairly easy to solve. So we think that different diseases should be handled in different ways. And therefore, we make probiotics and we select probiotic strains that are specifically targeted for a pestle-physiological um, process. And what do I mean? Well, I'm just going to show you in very simple terms how we do product development. For instance, we want to make a product for traveler's diarrhea. And then we go into literature and we think, okay, what's the causative agent of travel traveler's diarrhea? And most often it's ETEC. I'm sure that you, most of you know it's the enterotoxic E. coli, and that's the most causative agent of traveler's diarrhea. So then we look at our strains, we have about 80 of them, and we think, okay, which of these guys are good at inhibiting ETEC? And that's then the main design criterion. It's a little bit more complicated, but basically it's the main design criterion for a product for traveler's diarrhea. Then we want to look at allergy. Fairly different background. Because this strain, which is very good at inhibiting ETEC, okay, is it a good strain? Yes, it's a good strain. But can it do anything for allergy? No, because ETEC is not a causative agent of allergy. It, it doesn't cause allergy. So this strain is good for our traveler's diarrhea product, but it's not so good for an allergy product. For allergy, we look at immune modulation, and especially at the um, T regulatory cells, and it's fairly complicated, so I'm not going to go into detail, but we look more at the immune system, and we look at strains that are able to influence this immune system. And that's basically very simple, but how we do product development. And now I come to the lines that we have at Winklove. We have two lines at Winklove. And first of all, we have the ecologic line, and we sell that on a private label. And we ask for small co-brands. We put on the ecologic co-brand. Why do we do this? Because if um, our customers uh, sell the product, uh, for instance, in, in, in Austria, one of them is sold as Omnibiotic. If you go uh, as a doctor on PubMed and you uh, Google or you PubMed Omnibiotic, you will find no publications. Whereas if you've Googled a small co-brand, you will always find the publication. So there's a direct link for your health professionals with the publications and the scientific work. And in these ecologic lines, we look at applications, specific applications, for instance, for um, antibiotic use, for allergy, um, for um, uh, stress, um, for um, constipation, we look at a specific uh, problem and we design a specific problem for that, uh, a specific product for that problem. And then we do research with them. In, in our ecologic line, all our um, um, products are researched. We do clinical research with them. So first of all, we do vitro research and we design the product. And then, of course, we want to test these products too. Do they really work? 
And then we also have the Winklove line. The Winklove line is more broad spectrum, and then we focus more on age groups. We go into literature and we look at, okay, what's the imbalance or what's a normal baby microbiota and what's a normal adult microbiota? And then we focus more on these age groups, and we have also focused on all three levels because we want a broad spectrum product. And most of our customers start with one of these broad spectrum products, and they build up the market from there, and then they add on these ecologics. Also for this, we have data, this more vitro data, but because some of these products we have been so selling for such a long time, we have a lot of marketing experience and we have done some research also with these um, products. I'm not gonna show you all the clinical evidence because you'll be here forever, but I'm just gonna show you that we have really done a lot of research, PhD works as well, and it's been published. So um, yeah, it's, I think it's pretty, uh, pretty nice. Then, of course, I told about the bacteria, but then we also talk about the uh, technical application of the product. And you don't need you own not, not only want a product that has the good bacteria, but you also want it to be stable, of course, which I think is very important if you want to buy it. So we spend a lot of time and effort, effort also in what we call our probiotic technology, and that's something some ingredients that we add to our probiotics to improve the stability so we can guarantee a nice stability, to improve the survival of the bacteria, because you want them to survive the GI passage, you want them to survive the stomach, you want them still to be alive and kicking when they reach the colon because then they have the most effect. And we also want them to be metabolically active. And I'll explain this as the last part of my talk in a little bit more detail. Again, stability, I told you, we spend a lot of time and effort in um, uh, researching the stability of the products. And uh, I'm just showing you one of the products that we uh, have st stability data on. And in general, we can say that our products are stable at room temperature for one to two years. And most actually one and a half to, to two years. So that's something that we provide. And that's also because we add this uh, carrier that we put our bacteria on and it really uh, helped the stability of the product. Then survival of the GI tract. We select bacteria that are very well able to survive this uh, passage through the GI tract. And in collaboration with the Maastricht University Hospital, we've um, uh, um, uh, designed this model in which we simulate the passage through the GI tract and we add the things that the bacteria dislike most, which is bile, pepsin, low pH, pancreatine, and then we sample at different time points. And if the individual bacteria are not able to pass this model well, then they are not selected for our products. Of course, you can say this is vitro work. I have to say, yes, it's true. But one of the products that we came out of this test really well, we also tested it in vivo because you can actually culture bacteria from the features. We gave it to 100 students and we asked them to take the product or a placebo and then we cultured them and we found a very nice um, uh, return of the bacteria that was very compar comparable with what we found in the model. And then last but, last but not least, we don't only want them to be alive, but we want them to be alive and kicking, because if they are active, they will produce stuff like uh, lactic acids, hydrogen peroxide, bacteriocenes, and that's very important for the mechanism of action of probiotics. So this is also something that we um, um, uh, research a lot, and we look at the um, lactic acid production. And where lactic acid production is actually a probiotic function, and this is how you can test metabolically active bacteria. So if they're more active, they produce more lactic acids. Fairly easy. And uh, you can see here, for instance, that uh, they, yeah, they are able to do this very well. And then we've tested also some competitive products, and you see that they are less metabolically active. What we also do, sometimes we get requests from customers to add ingredients, and then we always test these ingredients on survival. Do they influence the survival of our bacteria? Do they influence the stability of the bacteria? But also, do they influence this metabolic activity, because if you add an ingredient which really decreases this metabolic activity uh, a lot, it's not a very good ingredient to add to your probiotic formulation. So guys, this is what I wanted to tell you today. Um, I want to thank you for your attention. If you, want to more, more know, if you want to know more about a specific product, or if you want to know more about the research, please visit us at our booth. We are located at Hall 7 and um, fairly easy to find. We're way in the back. So if you just go at the back of the hall, you will find us immediately. Thank you, guys. <laughs>